Hi, everyone. This is Martin Willis, and welcome to Podcast UFO for episode number 25. This is part one of two with Chris Lambright. He's written a book called X Descending. In this particular episode, we're going to speak mostly about Ray Stanford's film. The next episode with Chris will be mostly about the Paul Benowitz case. You can follow us on Twitter, or you can like us on Facebook, and those icons are on our website, which is podcastufo.com. If you'd like to contact me to say hello or for suggestions, that's info at podcastufo.com. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed today's show. All right, I'm on Skype with Chris Lambright for part one of two. How you doing, Chris? Doing fine, thanks. And where am I? Where am I uh, skyping you at? <laughs> I'm in Central Texas, actually, uh, not too far from Waco. Um, I'd gone to Baylor and I had some family down here, so. Uh-huh. But uh, yeah, it's halfway between Dallas and Austin. All right, all right. Well, I got done reading your book and. Uh, one of the most enjoyable books I've read on the subject, absolutely, called X Descending. The book is formatted in a way, you're basically telling your story, but with a lot of really good facts. So uh, can you just uh, talk a little bit about your book and what it took to put it together? Sure, sure. Um, originally, the, uh, the, my original idea for the, for the title actually came from uh, a screenplay that I had wanted to write, but at some point, having met Ray and realizing eventually that uh, that so little of what I knew about the uh, Paul Benowitz's experiences was actually out there, and virtually nothing of the the pictures that he the, the f- from the films that he originally got was out there. And after 20 years, you see all sorts of nonsense that's been just rehashed by people quoting someone else. And although I never intended to write a book on on the UFO phenomenon, I finally decided, you know, I do know a good bit about these two particular films. And it was when I saw that both films, in fact, or both cases, the Paul Benowitz's case and the film that Ray Stanford took, I began to find the connections that converged to the Air Force and specifically the Air Force Research Lab. And what I knew of the, the, the involvement there, I realized I didn't want to say nothing. I mean, it, it, I would have preferred to, that the information be out there. So I decided to put it into a book, and the second part focused on my own personal involvement and experiences in the Paul Benowitz case. But the goal of the book was to focus on these two films, what those films show. Nowhere in the book do I make the case this is aliens, although, as I said, I don't think Occam's razor is going to cut too easily, in particular when it comes to Ray's film. But the point is, this is a technology, and it's clearly visible on the film, and the evidence that's out there shows that if not, if if more than just people in the Air Force research lab somewhere, um, but people that are out there, especially Lake Maribo and some of the others, they're fully aware that these are films of vehicles demonstrating some kind of advanced technology that certainly isn't on any you know, at any airport I've seen or in any place. And what went in with Paul Benowitz clearly indicates a big effort to keep it quiet so uh, so anyway i thought it was it was just time to lay it all out in the book and it took a lot of time and a lot of things came out while i was writing that i i took the time to include as well but um but anyway that's the point is it's my experiences it's not just a generic book on the ufo phenomenon it is my experiences specifically what i know and learned from uh, the, these two cases or these two films <laughs> this is the first book i have read in a pdf format and the book is only available at this time online. I wanted to say that in Kindle. And what other formats is it in? Kindle and the EPUB format, which is primarily the one that Apple's tablets went with. But most other non-Kindle tablets that are out there, and you can even get readers for any of these formats on a computer. But, um, but the Kindle format, which is specifically um, Amazon's Kindle's format, the EPUB format, which is readable on just about any smartphone, any other kinds of tablet out there, your computer, whatnot, and a PDF file, which is also generally accessible on these tablets as well as smartphones and computers as well. There are slight differences between them, although I don't think it 
causes any uh, any issue, simply that there were some limitations on the size that illustrations are accepted on the Kindle format. So those illustrations are a little bit smaller, a little slightly smaller resolution, for example. The PDF and the EPUB formats give you a little bit more room, mm -hmm. maybe a little bit sharper images, you know, as far as zooming in on them. But that was one of my goals. I mean, and I still intend to have this thing published one way or the other in, uh, in hardback format. If some agent or some publisher wants to talk to me, I'm glad to talk to them. But i looking into some printing, doing it myself. Just the economics of the publishing industry right now make color pictures somewhat costly. And unless you're writing a super bestseller, it's hard to get somebody to kind of want to make the investment. But color, the, the color was the big thing to me. It had, you have to see it in color. And I was lucky that right at that time the tablets all came out. And now you can see color images on tablets and pinch zoom to zoom in on the details and whatnot. So it did work out well enough. But you're correct that right now it's only available in the three formats, the Kindle format, the EPUB format, and the PDF format. You can purchase any of the formats off of my own website, uh, excesspublishing.com, but you can also get the EPUB format from Apple's iBookstore, download to your iPad, or, of course, the Kindle format directly from Amazon. Getting into the book itself, the story of actually both of these gentlemen, first of all, uh, Ray, Ray Stanford's film uh, actually might uncover some type of advanced technology that Mirabeau later is starting to exploit and... Benowitz cover-up, uh, I would say it's a cover-up, and he is someone you end up feeling bad for because of how much all this delusional information pushed into him. And uh, just little tidbits of things that almost sounded real enough, and but it was all what they call disinformation to actually muddy the waters of anyone actually believing him and thinking he was basically insane. In fact, it seems like he was heading in that direction. And so I don't know which one you want to talk about first, either Ray Stanford's film or Paul Benowitz, but um, the call is yours, either one. Not as much, I think, has been talked about Ray Stanford's film, okay. simply because that's the less well-known one. The Benowitz case kind of became you know, the, uh, the fountainhead of so much that's become mainstay in ufology lately. Um, that it, but it, once again, it seems to me the, the important factor is to establish that both of these films show definitely vehicles. These are not orbs, little you know, out-of-focus lights in the distance, that sort of thing. These are films that definitely show something that's, that was it's definitely technological. And in the case of both films, if you trace back, you know, of course, Benowitz, after his meeting down at Kirtland, was, according to the documentation, um, suggest, it was suggested that he apply for an Air Force grant. And I believe it was the head, I think it was Ed Debreen was his name, the head of the Air Force Weapons Lab, offered to help him fill out the grant. Now, that's kind of an unusual thing to suggest to someone if you think he's crazy. You know, if you think he's presenting things that are just not... Now, for some reason after that, though, they decided not to go forward with it. Now, we can come up with all sorts of reasons why they might decide not to go forward with it, but clearly the Ed Breen must have thought there was something interesting enough. You know, I keep, I'm reminded of Lyndon Johnson's famous quote, if you excuse the, the wording here, which is, better to have your enemies on the inside pissing out than the outside pissing in. Mm -hmm. So it may be that at some point they thought, well, if we can get this guy to play ball, at least there's a better chance to kind of manage the situation. For some reason, that didn't happen. In other words, it, the, the sound, I don't know whether he just began to, as I call it, go off the reservation a little bit. He was calling everybody and spreading the word around. Or somebody came in and said, we are not going to give any more acknowledgement to what he's got by giving him a grant. Um, but it didn't happen with Paul Benowitz. It seemed to me that the opposite or the fix was already in starting in the middle of, of 1980 with a Wetzel letter. But in the case of, uh, of Ray's picture, it's kind of a story, as I describe in the book, of how uh, Lake Maribo happened to find out about Ray and go to visit him. But Maribo is someone who, in his own career, had already had connections or contacts with, I, I believe at one, of course, he had worked for BDM Corporation, I think, at one point. He had some connections in the Air Force through the uh, Breakthrough Propulsion Physics Program, I think, at the time. So he already, I think, had some good, and he was a player, so to speak, with, a, with the Air Force in, as well. 
And when he happened to see what Ray had on film, he already had his idea for his light craft, which was a kind of a beamed energy propulsion, small disc model they'd worked with. But if, as I point out in the book, if you notice the way the whole <laughs> image of this thing changed after he had seen what Ray had on film, and he went back and apparently was able to substantiate that some of the concepts that you could glean, that anybody, you would be able to glean it. It was one of the first things I noticed when I saw on a slide screen the pictures in Ray's film that the way this object was was flying, if you want to word it that way, which is basically if you take a, and not flat like a Frisbee, but flip it up so the, f I think in the film it's actually the underside, but basically one full face of this object is flying straight into the wind, as I call it, pancakes right into the wind with a beam firing out of the center as like one candlestick sticking out of the middle of a cake. The beam's firing forward as this thing moves along. And it's clear, it was clear to me, it would be clear to anyone, that that does not seem to be a very aerodynamic way to fly. And I remember talking to Ray about it, and I said, this beam must be doing something, that it's firing out in that direction ahead of this vehicle as it's moving along. And subsequently, as Ray enhanced the images, you can begin to see things happening around this beam, things are going on as I describe in the book. But it was one of those things that anybody with any rudimentary understanding of aerodynamics would look at and know something's going on. And that seems to be what Mirabeau, of course he's fully qualified, an expert in that kind of an area, he was able to glean that, that something going on and go back and actually test it in the lab. And that's kind of where I got into this whole thing because I had knew nothing about Mirabeau at the time. But when I read about an experiment that had been that had been conducted. And this was back in 1993 when there was a, the Skunk Works Digest was a fairly well-known on, online kind of a discussion like Google Groups today. But, but um, I read a mention of this and went and looked at the, at the picture that was taken in a hypershock tunnel, like a wind tunnel. Mm -hmm. And I saw that and I thought, whoa, that looks a lot like what Ray filmed. And I contacted Ray, called him immediately on the phone, and that's when he blurted it out. Oh, that must be Lake Mirabeau. I was here visiting you know, a few years ago looking at these pictures from the film. And I knew right then Mirabeau had taken this concept and, and tested it and realized that, yes, you can in fact affect, you can mitigate the shock wave and, and a lot of other potential benefits by projecting energy out in front of a vehicle as it's moving through an atmosphere. Um, and over the next few years, as I began to follow Mirabeau's work and realizing almost very quickly that he got a grant from the Air Force Research Lab to do experiments with his light craft. So he spent some time down at White Sands and what you know, whatnot. And a lot of this is described in the book. That's the whole point, is to outline what I found out and where and who was who was involved and what the connections were. But I just recall thinking that, boy, it was an interesting coincidence, if nothing else, that Benowitz gets offered a grant by one of the top men at the Air Force Weapons Lab. And the Air Force Weapons Lab is kind of the precursor to the Air Force Research Lab, even though at Kirtland, I believe now it's called their Space Vehicles Directorate. It's part of the overall Air Force Research Lab, and the, uh, the propulsion director, I believe, is kind of where Mirabeau got his uh, grant to, to work with, the, uh, with his light craft. But the point was, here are two films totally separated that both seem to tie right back into the Air Force and Air Force Research, Air Force Research Lab specifically. And, um, and maybe coincidentally or not, one of the locations that Mirabeau at one point had worked for, BDM Corporation, is a big, has, has one of its main operating locations was right there in Albuquerque, which is, of course, where Benowitz took his film. There were a lot of, a lot of really interesting coincidences that seemed to dovetail when it came down to, to actually who's maybe interested in this type of, of propulsion or this type of technology. But that's the, that was where my, whole reason for taking these two films and using them or as far as the, uh, the material in the book is because they both dovetail into ultimately work that I could point straight to the Air Force Research Lab, the Air Force in general, but the Air Force Research Lab, um, that kind of a, those, those people in particular. And there are a lot of connections in there, but Mirabeau's work ultimately I think shows that he knows we did not have the technology to do what Ray filmed back in 1985. And 
even after that, for years and years to come, we still have that, don't have that technology. And some of the reports that I was able to find by even some gentlemen at NASA on these new futuristic concepts that people were working with at the time showed that even just to do what Mirabeau conceived of, we don't have the infrastructure to even accomplish something like that. And one of the points that I think should be noted, though, is Mirabeau's concept typically only works with hypersonic velocities. What Ray filmed was not going hypersonic by any you know, stretch of the imagination at all, mm-hmm. meaning that's not just what's keeping it up. You may be able to mitigate shock waves using energy beam, you know, pro- pro- propelling or projecting energy out in front to basically expand the atmosphere away from your vehicle. So you're basically flying through a, a bubble, if you want to call it that, a low-density corridor. But that's not what apparently is keeping the object from falling out of the sky. Now, this would be a, a lot of times what you hear when these things take off at uh, supersonic speed and, and there's no uh, shock wave or anything like that. This would eradicate that, basically. But it wouldn't have anything to do with any type of propulsion um, out of atmosphere in any type of way, would it? Well, it maybe, and that's, that's the point. The point is, if you're traveling in an atmosphere, this directed energy, so to speak, the, the beam, what they call the, the directed energy air spike is what Mirabeau's concept was called, which is simply a way to basically m- move the atmosphere from around you way long before you get there and close it in behind you. So you're basically riding inside this low-density corridor that, yes, if you're not b- bursting through the atmosphere at those speeds, then sure, you have no shock wave. But, as I said, but once you're in an a- and out of the atmosphere... Sure, it, it may not be something that's required, but it is a good point that you make because it's clearly something that's useful for inside the atmosphere. I don't know that that means these objects would necessarily be flying out out of the atmosphere, but when Ray described having seen them, they came in kind of from over land, if you want to call it that, to where he was on the coastline, and just about when they were overhead, turned at a very steep angle and pretty much look like they're leaving the atmosphere, if you want to put it that way. But the point was they definitely took off and turned directions very quickly and headed almost straight up. So there's a lot more going on in the technology of what these vehicles were doing than than just the idea of that you or I or anybody might be able to deduce from from looking at the uh, from trying to imagine what this beam might be doing, but if that's what it's doing, and I think Mirabeau is right on the money, that the beam clearly is having an effect on an a- in the atmosphere, which means these vehicles clearly were intended at some point to have to deal with you know atmospheres or man- maneuver the atmosphere out of the way that sort of thing, but uh, to have seven of these things flying along in procession back in 1985, I, I, don't, I think it's, it'd be a hard case to come up with who built those things, you know, back when Ray filmed them, or at least who, it wasn't just a production model at that point. I mean, it wasn't just one test vehicle. Somebody had already built seven of these things. Where they came from, who knows? Now, Mirabeau would never really come out and admit that he was influenced by those films that he actually saw at Ray's house for his uh, work in the future? Well, I, uh, not yet. Um, I, I do want to qualify this and say Mirabeau wasn't the only one there with Ray when this went on. There was someone else there, so there is a second person who can verify. Plus, Ray's got material that he was sent by Mirabeau that can substantiate this as well. Um, I don't fault Mirabeau for being cautious at all, although I know that I know he knows, and, um, and I've spoken with him myself. And once again, I'm not making any other claims. I am absolutely happy that he was able to go out and demonstrate that what was being demonstrated by these vehicles Ray filmed, in fact, has practical uses. Um, But perhaps in his career, his position, I don't know if there are other requirements, he seems to really want to lay low. Um, been very, very cautious. And he told me one time that uh, you know, if he's in an interview and anybody brings up the subject of UFOs, he's out of there. So why that would be, you know, I would hope at some point he would come out. And I, do, I wish at some point he would just come out and say, okay, this is the way it is. But, uh, but needless to say, my aim is not to focus specifically on Mirabeau any more than, uh, you know, than any other scientists who have seen what Ray has on film and, have, and know good and well that this is clearly evidence of some technology that we don't have, at least not 
us here now in the last 50 years. But, um, but yeah, but the, the proof is out there. I just don't understand why the UFO community, if you want to word it that way, has not picked up on this and run with it. We have so much discussion, the disclosure project, sending petitions to the White House. We've got all of these other things that have been going on, and nobody seems to want to pick one particular or, or to grab hold of this, this information that's definitely there and use that, you know, to, to get some kind of a beachhead on this whole thing. So I, I don't know. I'm dismayed sometimes with ufology as a whole, but, um, but I, don't, I don't necessarily blame it on the people themselves because I think to a great extent, if you, in the long run, we're going to find out that a, a lot of what's uh, the, the heads of uh, or maybe the leadership in some of these, the primary groups that we have now, MUFON, whoever else, may very well be part of the way that the thing is being controlled. I mean, right, right. I, I, I started to write a paper called, uh, <laughs> well, I started it a while back and I keep putting it off, called Why Ufology Will Fail. And, uh, and I think one of the thoughts that kind of got me thinking this way was from 1947, I think, to 1969, the Air Force had projects ongoing. They had signed, grudge, Project Blue Book ran until 1969, and we know there were any number of profound cases, Socorro, any number that occurred in that time frame. If it was worth it to them to pay that money to, to have these programs ongoing for more than 20 years, why in 1969 did they suddenly just stop? Yeah. I mean, to me, it, I've always thought that was just, okay, it's too public. Let's tuck it under, uh, you know, somewhere hidden away from the public. Yeah. And it's very possible that they had found out enough to know that the, that there's something going on. They had enough information to work with now that they didn't need to keep having, like you were saying, a public face on it. But look at what's happening now. The technologies that are available with just a simple cell phone, digital cameras, people having the ability to communicate instantly. It seems to me there are going to be things that will be happening out here that they would want to keep you know, to be aware of, if nothing else, some way to manage the situation. How do you keep it? Look what happened to Paul Benowitz. How do you make sure people don't pay too much of attention? Um, it would seem to me that the logical place to, to do that from would be to have public groups, but able to, in some way to manage the information that comes through. There's information that, I mean, I, I, don't, know, I don't know if you've ever had experience with this, but I've talked to other people about it, that there are cases that are reported, for example, to MUFON, and my term is they're black hold. They go. You won't, you won't ever find out any more about it because I've contacted the uh, uh, one individual at MUFON one time just because there was a picture that I thought might very well tie into something in my book. And I asked, would you be willing to just send my email address to this witness because MUFON will not divulge any information on, on the witness. or the, And no, they wouldn't even do that. No. Hmm. I think the witness probably thought they were doing the right thing by reporting it. That's why I would, my recommendation to the, anybody who sees something is tell everybody. Don't All just, the sites. There's plenty of sites you can report to. Yes, get it out there somehow because, unfortunately, there are cases that I've, there are ways to find some information on this that, that you won't find in the MUFON database now. They're not there. Other reports that come through that, once again, something comes through and, either that gets written off as a simple contrail. I have a case, I have it sitting, just sitting right by me here of uh, something that by all accounts would be a mothership taken by a woman up in Connecticut. And it's, I have no explanation for what this is. Far more clear than that Salida, Colorado video that's uh, all you can find on YouTube. Really? Wow. And Mufon said, it's a contrail. Huh. And if you look at this thing, no. <laughs> it is by no means a contrail. Um, but once again, if I hadn't been able to track her through some other ways, you're not going to get... And, and I wish MUFON would change that. That's one of the points I keep trying to make. I wish they would change that. But at the same time, if the information's reported and the witness thinks they've done their job and they think somebody's looking into it, but the case is never going to get out there. And especially if it's not in that database, it's basically... It's effectively black hold. And, um, and I just... It, and I don't know what's there that you and I might love to know about. Um, but we'll never see it. So I don't know. It's just hard to know how to deal with that. Right. I get a lot of emails from this podcast, and I received an email the other day of someone that just had a sighting in Texas, actually. And I basically told him, I gave him several links, and I said, report it to them all. You know, I just wanted to make sure that he reported it to one or at least one or more. Oh. 
You're absolutely right. I mean, even on my own website, which uh, Excess Publishing, I have, there's a link in the top, you'll see, to the X desk. And under there, I put a place, I'm more interested, if possible, in photographic cases or cases where there's some film or some imaging to them. But um, I even have a link there, although I've not really made an effort to publicize it, that if somebody wants to report something, you know, I'm more than happy to, to, to hear it. Now, at least I'll have a database of it there that's somewhere else. But you're right. We have MUFON, and we've got the National UFO Reporting Center. Those are the primary two that people will get to mm-hmm. if they're referred to there by whomever. And if it's not made public by MUFON, and I think you'll notice I wrote in the book about the instance of the uh, Dallas MUFON chapter that were very dismayed when they heard even back in the day that Walter Andrus told them some of the best cases never make it into the MUFON journal. And they were staggered. Why? And so this is way back then. So to this day, it all appears in a database. And how hard is it to just make sure, you know, a little check on a box someplace and that case doesn't show up in the database. But, but it bothers me because people don't realize that that's happening, that there's only two places. And it, between you and me, if I was somebody in the intelligence community, I mean, you just need the secretary to be <laughs> answering the phone and refer, you know, to know what's coming in. And who's to say that maybe that's one of the ways things like this are kind of maintained is that the person who's, you know, the person who has control over that database can make sure nobody sees certain things. And it all depends upon, because that goes in and it's automatically put into the database images in the whole nine yards. So it's, it would be very easy at that point. I wouldn't need Project Blue Book anymore. It's like somebody says, you know, what does the CIA or the NSA need to worry about eavesdropping on everybody? We put everything on Facebook. Uh, they go to yeah. Facebook, trace all your friends, trace who's connected to whom, you know, whatever. So it's, these days we're doing their job for them. That's but, right. Uh, that's right. Now getting back to Ray's film, the position of the craft and the energy projection out in front, the spike, has anyone else reported any other uh, visual like that? Um, the, the overall shape of the craft has been reported in a number of places. The two that come to mind, um, especially the, the beam being, propo- um, being projected out front, There was a gentleman who worked for NASA. I just cannot recall his name right off the top of my head, but the reports, you can find it online. He had, he made a, he put a report one time about having been somewhere in South America, I think it was, and he and some people were in a, in a boat rowing along a river and saw two objects coming in low and he, the image that he drew of them sounds very much like what Ray described, that there was a beam projecting forward from these uh, these two objects as they came in. And if, if I recall, the, the drawing of them was very, very similar as well. So the idea of a beam being projected in front of moving craft like this, I don't know of any that have <laughs> had eight of them in procession as clear as Ray had. Um, the one that I told you that I saw on the MUFON site, or that I, I take it back, I don't think I even came across it on MUFON, I think it was an examiner.com article, had a photograph, a gentleman had parked his car one night and saw this something coming across a field. It was obviously, it looked like it was a fire, so to speak, that kind of a coloration. But he ran down it with his cell phone of his camera phone and took a picture of this thing as it's going across the field. What I noted was unusual about it was that it had that kind of aspect to it. It was, it looked the main part or part of it seemed to be perpendicular or rather vertical and some kind of a projection, almost like a, the letter T, some kind of a projection sticking out the left side. Now, my question, all I wanted to know initially was what direction was this thing traveling? Mm-hmm. If it was going towards the prong, the sticking out the front, or was it going the other way? You know, it would have made a lot of difference to me to just know because it wasn't clear from that small picture whether it was moving to the left or moving to the right. So I tracked down the whoever had originally hosted the, the page where the picture was and contacted him and said, you know, I'm very curious if there's more information on this report. I mean, it tells us what day it was taken, gives his description, but nothing says the object was going to the left or moving what direction. And he didn't even really know. And so I said, well, is there a chance to contact the witness? Well, no, I can't give you that information. Well, can you give him my email address? Oh, I just, at this stage, just want to have an idea. Does he have a better, a higher resolution picture, a copy of that image 
because I thought it was clear enough there might be something you could determine about it. And was it going to the left or to the right? You know, so I could know was this projection, was this beam sticking forward, so to speak. Um, and he said, no, we can't even get, you know, MUFON doesn't let me do that. I think that was the wording of it. And there, that was a perfect, oh, that was the most frustrating thing. All I wanted to know was what direction was it going? They hadn't even gotten that much information on the, on the sighting. But it was a pretty, pretty nice, clear, on a dark kind of background image. Um, oddly enough, one of the other places that I recall having seen a drawing of a the quintessential disc-shaped looking object, which... To mention in Ray's film, uh, it's not real clear in the pictures that I have, but Ray has shown these pictures to others. There are a number of frames of this film. This object is project in Ray's film is projecting this beam from, as I mentioned earlier, what I think you might call the underside, let's say the bottom of it. If you took the quintessential disc-shaped craft with a dome on the top, turned it up so that the dome is to the backside, the direction of travel, and the bottom, it's flying with, a, with, the, with that fa- other face forward, the beam is coming out of that, what do you say, the center of the bottom, and I don't mean to misrepresent that, but the idea is it's flying in that direction, because the other side, you can clearly see an indication of some kind of a dome structure or something on the other side. But if you recall the case from 1959, I believe it is, the Father Gill case from Papua New Guinea, I have a whole set, a PDF file set of the pages of... Uh, I think it was, there was his name, Crutwell, whoever the other priest was, who kind of gathered together all the reports that were reported by the individuals around that time in, in Bonai and wherever it was in uh, Papua, near Papua New Guinea. Um, and in one of the drawings, here is an object, looks like the disc shape with a dome on it. A lot of them are showing it kind of horizontally. But in one of these drawings, here is this thing turned straight up on edge. So clearly whoever saw that and drew it for him seemed to be indicating that it, one of the vehicles that they were watching or objects they saw seemed to be standing on that, you know, turned vertically as, a roast, as opposed to horizontally. So I've seen that aspect in, you know, in other illustrations and other cases, and I think Ray's got plenty of others. But, um, but as I said, that may just be the way these were traveling at that time. There's no way to know that. Any of the objects that you might see might very easily be able to flip over, you know, and travel in, in one direction or the other. But, um, but yeah, I mean, uh, there are other reports out there of it. It's just I'm sure there are more than I've got my, <laughs> gotten access to. So one other question comes to mind is uh, how did Ray go about seeing these and filming them to begin with? Oh, boy, that's a great story. <laughs> one of the things that I recall that he'd said uh, was, and he was at a time in his life, he happened to be down on, uh, I believe it was Emerald Cove or Emerald Bay, which, and there's a park um, right near this cove with, uh, where the breakwater is. It has a, a small part that you can uh, you could apparently walk out on. And he was there with his children, his, his daughter and, uh, and one of his sons, I think. And apparently he had, uh, it, what I recall from Ray, when I first met him, um, and I met him, I think a year before that, but it was a year or two after that that I finally got a chance to go visit him at his house. But when I first met him, one of the first things that I recall was the guy carries this camera with him everywhere. Hmm. He had a backpack. We were leaving to go eat, and he made me turn the car around and go back to his house because he had to get that backpack with a camera. So be prepared. (laughs) In other words, that was one of the things I noticed. He was definitely prepared. But he was out on this breakwater with his children, and he told me laughingly that he had always told his children if any one of them ever saw something unusual and pointed it out to him, he'd pay them ten dollars. <laughs> so, for what I guess that motivates the ch- children. These were little little kids at the time, right? And apparently, he was out on this pier, a little breakwater out there, and there was another family was out there as well. So there were other witnesses to this case, this sighting. Um, but at one point, his children pointed, "Daddy, you know what's that?" and when he looked up, he said he almost dropped, he had some, still some images or slides in his backpack when he put it down to get the camera, it almost dropped them in the water. But uh, he pulled that camera out and just started cranking off film on it and he got film of the first four of them before he ran out of film in the camera. So the, the remaining two or three of them, he didn't get those on film. But he filmed these things with his camera as they were proceeding across the sky and if you're standing on the cove and once again i will defer to ray to clarify any details that i mistake here but if you stand on the cove and you're basically facing south these things were coming in from 
inland off to the, uh, I believe it was the northeast, slightly that direction. So they came over, you know, over land, so to speak, towards the coast where he was, and then would turn and almost go straight up. So he was able to film all of this stuff happening. And in the film, you get images that seem that show basically the leading face of these, the vehicle as it's coming over, and then some of the backside. So he's got some really great images of this particular film. I'll preface all of this by saying this is not the only film Ray has over a, his 50 or some more years he's been involved in this. He's got some very, very compelling films. Um, but this one I focus on because of the situation with Mirabeau and the Air Force. But it is a profound bit of film. There are things that I've seen as he and I have looked at some of these images that that are just incredible, um, as he calls them calls it propulsion diagnostic. When you look at things going on in the atmosphere around, not only can you see the beam, you begin to see the plate the, uh, points further out on that beam as it begins to flare. You begin to see all sorts of things happening that it, it takes a good bit of, you know, of looking and studying the overall image to see these patterns. Uh, but it is one of the things that Ray, definitely one of his innate skills and, and abilities he has, which is to notice these subtle patterns. Of course, it's paid off a lot in his paleontological work as well, looking for dinosaur tracks and things like that. But the ability to see this is clearly the proof in the pudding is, of course, <laughs> Mirabeau saw it, and he saw it instantly. You and you would see it. I mean, this is not something hard to tell. You would be able to recognize it, but it's an incredible bit of film showing a lot of things going on around this, these vehicles as they come across the sky. But that's how he happened to get it. He just happened to be out there, and his children pointed it out to him. So <laughs> I guess have, they both... Do you know if they, he paid them the $10? I believe they got their money, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Worth it that time. Uh, yeah. Now, I want to... The next show we're going to do, we're going to be talking about Paul Benowitz more. You just found out some new information in a peer-reviewed paper. Can that kind of ties in with this. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Um, once again, it's one of those things that I would defer to the experts, to uh, Mirabeau and uh, um, and Professor Meeson. But in August of this year, there was a conference given in Moscow. Apparently, it's given every year. And it's the PROGRESS, if I get this correctly, P-I-E-R-S, PROGRESS in Electromagnetic uh, Research Symposium. Um, and... If you recall the case I mentioned to you, the uh, 1989, 1990 Belgian sightings, where there were some very unusual deltoid or triangular-shaped vehicles that were sighted over Belgium, and um, one of the very prominent professors, who's a been a very big supporter of the of this phenomenon, the subject, um, was a gentleman named Auguste Meissen, who's a Belgian professor and a very renowned, I mean, qualified individual. But um, he apparently presented three papers at this last conference in uh, in Moscow. Um, if someone wants to go look for the papers, they're there. But the papers that show not only some of the reported effects, but the, the evidence for these effects of electromagnetic radiation, things that are occurring, optical effects and otherwise. Um, and he did definitely focus to a great extent or in, in a big way on some of the evidence that Ray Stanford has gotten in, in the, at least one or two of the films that I know that were mentioned in the article that demonstrate clearly some highly unusual things going on, optical effects, things that you can catch on film that, uh, that unfortunately a lot of it's there. And I just wonder how many people out in the, in ufology over the last number of years have gotten images of things and they don't know what to look for. In other words, you just don't see it. That's, of course, I've had that experience with the dinosaur tracks, but, but the, uh, the Moscow, the, I guess you'd call it the proceedings have been published. And um, if anybody goes and looks up the, the uh, peers conference, they'll be able to find the papers by Augusta Meeson. But here is a gentleman who obviously is a well-established scientist. Mirabeau, Mirabeau did his thing. Augusta Meeson has substantiated that there are scientists who are obviously looking at this information and can show you the evidence for why this deserves far more serious thought um, and uh, and research than than is widely known, you know. But it's it's like one of those uh, nicely kept little secrets that nobody really wants to talk about, but they are talking about it. It's just unfortunately, the ufology, as I mentioned, I think the other day, ufology seems to be asleep at the wheel for a lot of this kind of information that's out there. Uh, they seem to be doing the same thing the same way they've done it for 50 years. And um, and I think there is a lot of there are a lot of things happening 
that I think would be far better, could be put to far more use, far more effective if you just want to, to, uh, you know, to get some information out uh, that people seem to be missing. But these papers are there. I mean, at the, uh, if you look up the Peers Conference proceedings for 2012, you'll be able to find those papers listed there. Okay, one more thing. I noticed that in your book you mentioned a number of times how guarded Ray was of this particular film. And um, I found it rather curious that he wasn't really looking to put this information out there. Uh, and how did that go when you released this in the book between you and him as far as friendship and tension? <laughs> oh, boy, there's a good one. Well, Ray and I have been friends a long time. To some extent, we're more like, you know, he's my older brother now, just in, a, in a way. But we are, we are friends. We have different... Uh, approaches to things, and maybe that works, but we 've had our share of arguments over it and um, and he is he's he 's protective for all the right reasons, I think, but it 's taken wrongly by people who seem to just want to demand to be shown. He has never refused to show anybody if you want to go see him or meet some place where you know he 's going to be, he will show what he has to anybody who 's willing to come and take a you know take a serious look at it. But, but just because he doesn't post it on YouTube, I mean, both of us got kind of, uh, we got beat up on a little bit in, in the first interview that, that where he and I were both, you know, a part of it because people say, why don't you just put it on YouTube as though YouTube is somehow the arbiter of, you know, legitimacy these days. Mm -hmm. And we all know what happens on YouTube. People take pot shots because they're anonymous and you don't really know who's taking the shot. And I think it's been proven to, that, that he's correct. Yes. I mean, I keep telling him over and over, you know, my, my analogy that people have to see this. You know, you're going to take some heat, but this is worth seeing. But as I, as I mentioned before, scientists have seen it. People have seen this. But he is very, very protective of it simply because, you know, we all know the phrase, presentation is everything. That to an extent, you have to be, a, well, let me put it this way. It's one of the things that gives me the most... And that's the most frustrating thing with Paul Benowitz's case is he's no longer here mm -hmm. to be able to tell us the details and to show us and explain. And I've told Ray plenty of times. I said, Ray, if something ever happened to you, you know, we're not getting any younger. If something happens to him, all of that information that is in that mind of his is just gone. Right. I mean, it needs to be out there. If nothing else, you know, it needs to be out there. But I don't want anybody to ever <laughs> mistake the idea that just because he doesn't put this on YouTube or just because he's not out here, you know, standing on a soapbox and trying to sh throw everything out there for everyone to see, that it has in any, in anything to do with what I personally am staking my own reputation on, the effectiveness and the quality of what he's got. Because all I have to do is step back and say, and point to Mirabeau, and point to Meeson, and point to a number of other people that that are far more knowledgeable, and I guess you would say have, you know, their PhDs on their names to uh, to substantiate, you know, that, that he's got the goods. But he is very... He's willing to show it to anybody, and he's shown this at presentations in, uh, in Arizona, at a presentation over in uh, Europe, I think a few years ago, but, but he'll show it to anyone. It's just a matter of he's very cautious about what typically tends to happen if you just post it online and you have no idea who, for reasons of their own, will want to just start taking pot shots at it or making negative comments about it, you know, that sort of thing. And unfortunately, these days, you really don't know <laughs> who's, who's the, really behind some of the things that are said or posted here and there and why. But, um, but he's, he definitely has got the goods on it. And I've stayed up till 3 o'clock in the morning many times <laughs> trying to enhance some of the images of, from the films that he's got. But, um, but believe me, the things that what I show in my book is just the tip of the iceberg. It's a very substantial tip, but it's the tip of the iceberg for the types of things he's got and the types of things that were, were shown in, uh, in the paper that was presented at the peers conference and whatnot. But it's good stuff. Speaking of YouTube, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of bogus pieces up on YouTube as well, um, and some of them are very well done. So it, it's kind of hard to distinguish what is right and what isn't on YouTube, so I totally understand that. Listen, this has been great, and you're going to come back with us for another interview. We're going to talk mostly about the Paul Benowitz case then. Thank you so much, Chris. This has been wonderful. I really appreciate it. Thanks very much. So this is Martin Willis with Chris Lambright, and that's it for today.